Welcome to ASHA Science Institute. In this video, we are going to discuss current affairs, topic wise current affairs for prelims 2019. So, in the current affairs section, we have this topic wise keywords initiative. So, you can go through that, go to that. And here in this video, we are going to discuss SNT science and technology. So, this is the SNT section. Noble has already been discussed, a video has been uploaded. In this video, we are going to discuss space. ISRO. So, space is a huge coverage. So, it has been divided into three categories. So, first one we will see space is row. So, this is the PDF for that. You can download it. So, here is the PDF. So, in, uh, in SNT space, the Indian Space Research Organization, the developments which have taken place, right, like the Unnati Unispace Nano Satellite Assembly and Training, which has been started by ISRO. And then Mission Gaganyan, which is a three-month course, you know, for people, for engineers from all across various countries. So the first course is from Jan to March 2019, the first phase. And this is regarding Mission Gaganyan to take Indian astronaut into space by 2022. Then the Chandrayaan 2 mission, which has been planned. So this is has been delayed quite often, but now it finally be launched in July 2019, and uh, so it will have an orbiter. A lander which will land on moon on the moon south pole which has been named Vikram in memory of Vikram Sarabhai who is said to be the pioneer of space science in the country and the lander will have a rover which will come out of it and a six wheel rover which will move on the moon's surface. So the rover has also been named Pragyan, P-R-A-G-Y-A-N, Pragyan. So this is there then this is regarding HISIS hyperspectral imaging satellite which was also launched by ISRO along with 40 along with 30 foreign satellites then we had uh, even the fourth stage PSLV satellite with fourth stage PSLV DL satellite with fourth stage which would not be becoming a space junk but which will be orbiting and becoming uh, you know be used for a satellite experiment so this uh, student developed satellite smallest satellite ever called Kalamsat V2 in memory of uh, former president of India, APJ Abdul Kalam. So this is also significant development for India, where the fourth stage is also being used, not becoming space debris. And also about Mission Shakti, the anti-satellite missile test which India conducted. So we'll be discussing all this and others in this in this video. So this is the entire coverage of what we are going to discuss. There are around 35 topics. So these are the keywords. So if you look at the keywords, you should be able to link it to what is it all about. Like Navik has already been asked in 2018 too. So you should know about it. Navik, navigation with Indian constellation. So it has been developed by ISRO. It is still being developed. We had uh, you know, snags with this. The uh, rubidium clocks actually on them, on these satellites failed because of which we have to now launch more replacement satellites too. So this is Navik, which is also called IRNSS means Indian Regional Navigation Satellite System. So it's a regional navigation system similar to US GPS, Global Positioning System. GPS is global, India's is regional. And you should know about US GPS. GPS is freely available to all, but US can at any point of time deny access to anybody. So presently it is globally available freely. So that's there. And then there are also military applications of GPS and sometimes US does not allow us detailed, you know, information through gps so india needs to have its own positioning system to navigation system so that's what is being developed through navic so first of all you should know that navic is a constellation of seven indian navigation satellites which have been named 1a to 1g that is irnss indian regional navigation satellite system satellites 1A to 1G that comprises A to G becomes 7. So they were put in orbit between July 2013 to April 2016. So in these 3-4 years we completed our entire constellation of 7 satellites. So they are, you know, they are, the plan is that they will provide us 24 hour precise information of location and time of persons or objects. So all 7 must work together. So what has happened is that our satellites have failed. They were built as such uh, to last for 10 years but all three rubidium atomic clocks which have been procured from europe on the first satellite irnss 1a reportedly failed in 2016. so these rubidium atomic clocks are the ones which give us precise time 
for precision these atomic clocks are required and each satellite each of these seven satellites carries three atomic clocks including one standby two so these satellites have suffered you know three more satellites have suffered one or two dysfunctional clocks so these rubidium atomic clocks failing have resulted in our system being going haywire and we need more satellites to be launched to replace them so because of these failing imported atomic clocks nine of the 21 so if each seven has three means 21 clocks are there so nine out of these 21 have failed so now ISRO has decided to add buffers to the NAVIC by adding four more satellites. So the first spare or backup satellite which will be launched after INSS 1G is INSS 1H. But this INSS 1H launch also flogged in August 2017. So it was PSLV C39 mission which carried INSS 1H navigation satellite but it failed after the heat shield refused to open and release the satellite. So this launch was a failure. Then we launched INSS 1I which has been launched in April 2018 on PSLV C41. So IRNSS 1I has also been built by a consortium of Indian industries under the guidance of engineers of ISRO Satellite Center. So some 70 engineers from private sector have been involved in assembly, integration and testing of 1I and 1H IRNSS satellites. Also, ISRO says that INSS 1I, similar to its senior navigation sibling to its navigation payload, transmits signals in L5 and S band and gives position, velocity, and time of objects on ground. ISRO also plans to have indigenous atomic clocks in each of the satellites too now because these imported clocks from Europe have failed. So, indigenous atomic clocks are being developed by Space Application Center of ISRO in Ahmedabad. So here this is regarding INSS, you should know. So there are three geostationary and four geosynchronous satellites in INSS. So here you can see. So it covers India and up to 1500 km beyond its borders. So that is the coverage. It's a regional satellite which covers not just India but 1500 km beyond our borders too. So it will help uh, neighbors of India also being covered. So you can see GPS receivers will not work. You know, uh, they need special receivers which are yet to be developed. So, the satellites, these satellites, one in, once in place, when we want navigation, there will be receivers which also have to be developed. This is not a GPS system, this is a separate navigation system, so separate re receivers would be required. So, that's what has been stated here. The cost is given. The satellites they have been put in an orbit 36,000 km above the Earth's surface, that is the geostationary orbit as we know. What are these geostationary and geosynchronous? What the terminology means is also very important. We will see that too. And you can see it provides standard positioning service which is open to all users. Accuracy is better than 20 meters. So you can see approximately 20 meters as such. The four in geosynchronous orbit. So they will be in pairs. They move in two inclined orbitals. Uh, they appear from ground to travel in figure 8. And they assist in accurate position determination and three satellites are in geostationary orbit which appear from the ground to be at fixed position in the sky. So what is geostationary and geosynchronous that also you should understand. So this is the geosynchronous ones which are shown here. So this is regarding the INSS 1I being launched to the new satellite replacement satellite launched. So you can see. And what is GPS, the global positioning system of uh, USA is also discussed here. So this is GPS which comprises of 24 satellites. Now it comprises of 7. GPS comprises of 24 satellites which has been developed by US Department of Defense. So it is basically for defense purposes for USA. So they do not give GPS which is openly available open as such. That is not giving as much precision as the Department of Defense of USA gets. So there the resolution is quite high. Is, uh, NAVIC we saw it is 20 meters. Accuracy is better than 20 meters. And uh, you can see so it can provide accurate positioning 24 hours a day anywhere in the world. There is no subscription fee or setup charges to use GPS. GPS satellites are also called NAVSTA which is the official US Department of Defense name for GPS. So what is NAVSTA? It is same as GPS. It is the official name as such. And here you can see further detail being given to. So it provides critical capabilities to military, civil and commercial users around the world. The US government created the system 
it maintains it and makes it freely accessible to anyone with a gps receiver then there is also uh, there are also other global navigation satellite systems like uh, you know uh, glonass of russia which is global china's bido is global galileo of europe is global while india's irnss or navic is regional japan also has qzss regional navigation satellite system so these global names also you should know so this is geostationary and geosynchronous orbit being shown here too so geostationary orbit is at a height of 35780 km from the surface of the earth so these satellites in this orbit which is actually perpendicular to the uh, axis of rotation of the earth so so this orbit actually is the one where the satellites appear to be at a fixed position from the surface of the earth so its period of revolution the orbital revolution is same as period of rotation of the earth and as as it is at perpendicular to the axis of inclination of the earth to axis of rotation of the earth to its its movement is stay uh, is so that anybody on the surface of the earth will always find it moving uh, you know at the same position in the sky means though we cannot see it but it will be at the same position so if it's seen with a telescope or something so that's what it is that it is stationary from the surface of the earth at any point on the surface of the earth you will always see it at the same position and geosynchronous orbit is any orbit which is you know at the same location but then it will be not perpendicular to the axis of in, of rotation of the earth so it, there are multiple possibilities for that you can see so you can you can have these uh, orbits at any inclination with respect to the axis of rotation of the earth this is the axis of rotation you can see which we know is slightly inclined and this is perpendicular the geostationary orbit is its orbital plane is perpendicular to the axis of rotation if it is not perpendicular and it's having any other inclination with the axis of rotation then it is called geosynchronous orbit because synchronous means it will be synchronized with the period of rotation of the earth means any orbit which is having the same period of revolution as period of rotation of the earth it is synchronous so geostationary orbit is also geosynchronous orbit but mean geostationary is a special feature that it is also at right angle to the axis of rotation there are innumerable geosynchronous orbits but only one geostationary orbit and geostationary orbit is very important for the communication satellites they are launched in this geostationary orbit but in navic we saw there are four, four in geosynchronous orbit in three in geostationary orbit the no, seven satellites and you can see this is the prelims 2018 question on irnss navic so it says with reference to the indian regional navigation satellite system irnss consider the following statements and there are three statements the first statement is irnss has three satellites in geostationary and four satellites in geosynchronous orbit so if what we just discussed this is proof then second is irnss covers entire india in about 5500 square kilometer beyond its borders this is incorrect it is 1500 square kilometer we we'll see the image again and this is india will have its own satellite navigation system with full global coverage it's not global it's regional so it has regional coverage by the middle of 2019 which is incorrect so 2 and 3 are incorrect its answer correct answer is a one only so that is the answer given here and we we'll see the image you can see you should know three geostationary four geosynchronous satellites as we just discussed coverage is 1500 km beyond its borders so that is the so this is in situ this is india and this is beyond our border 1500 km coverage and of course it is regional then the next is gsnv continuation program phase 4 so this is regarding gsnv geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle which india has uh, the major vehicles which we have is gslv and pslv the pslv stands for polar satellite launch vehicles for to non satellites in geosynchronous or geostationary orbit geostationary as we discuss is also a geosynchronous orbit so for such uh, launches gslv satellite is used so communication satellites as such even the human space flight program the chandrayaan mission will be using gslv so union cabinet has approved phase 4 of gslv so for the period 2021 to 2024 and 2729 crore rupees has been allocated for the purpose 
So you can see ISRO uses JSLV, the second of its three launches, to put 2000 kg class of communication other satellites to first a geosynchronous uh, orbit that is uh, about 36,000 kilometers away that we discussed. So that is the geosynchronous orbit and the specialized type is geostationary orbit. So any orbit 36,000 kilometers away from the surface of the earth and that altitude is a geosynchronous orbit. So around the globe, you can see there are multiple number of such orbits which we can make, you know. But then one which is perpendicular to the axis of rotation of the earth is called geostationary orbit. So it's exactly not 36,000, it's 35,070 kilometers. The next is GSAT-29. So this is the satellite GSAT-29, which is a communication satellite which was launched by ISRO on GSLV MK3D2, the satellite launch vehicle in November 2018. So this was first placed in a geosynchronous transfer orbit and then to a geostationary orbit. So what is a geosynchronous transfer orbit also you should understand. So first you can see the earth since these orbits are elliptical. So there is an apogee and a perigee. Apogee where it is closest to the surface of the earth and perigee when it is farthest. So this is the transfer orbit, a highly elliptical orbit. So from this lower earth orbit when it is placed, the satellite is placed in this and then it is reaching this perigee from where it goes into this geosynchronous circular orbit. So, first it is placed in uh, transfer orbit, then it goes to geostationary orbit. So, this is a communication satellite in uh, weighing 3423 kg. It has KU and KA bands as such and it is, part, it is one of the four planned Indian high throughput satellites. So, there are quartet four such satellites planned and they are, these are to provide vastly improved and faster internet connectivity in India. So, the others have been placed already in orbit. GSAT-19 is the first one in the series which was placed in June 2017 in orbit and now it is GSAT-29. So, this is the detail of GSAT-29. Then, next is the difference between geosynchronous and geostationary orbits which we have already discussed. So, this should make it clear. You can see this geostationary orbit is perpendicular to the axis of rotation. And the geosynchronous orbit will, will be at an angle, at an inclination. And there are many such geosynchronous orbits possible. But geostationary, there is only one possibility. And all of them are at 36,000 km, 36, km from the surface of the Earth. So artificial satellites, can uh, they are sent in geostationary orbit or in polar orbit. So, geostationary orbit is used for communication satellites generally, even for human space flight as we saw, the Ganyan mission too, and polar orbits, Chandrayaan mission, and for polar orbits, the satellites here are launched for mapping and weather monitoring. INS satellites, that is uh, you know, regional uh, uh, IRS, so remote sensing satellites are polar satellites. Then this is GSAT-11. So GSAT-11 is also a heavy communication satellite. It is the heaviest communication satellite built by ISRO. It is weighing more than 5,000. You can see it's around 6,000 kg, 5,854 kg satellite. It's also a high throughput satellite, you know, so a part of the quartet. But then it's such a heavy satellite cannot be launched by India's GSLV launch vehicle. So it has been launched by European Space Agency. So, Orion rocket of European Space Agency will launch it from Kourou in French Guiana in South America. So, it was proposed to be launched in April 2018, but then it was recalled by ISRO. It was sent to French Guiana too, but then it was recalled because uh, you know, the ISRO wanted to conduct additional technical checks. So, this is it. So, then later it was sent back and has been launched. It also carries transponders for the first time in the complex and efficient KA frequency band too. So, the eight transponders here and 38 in KU band. So, that is the frequency band as such. And it will provide 16 Gbps service over the Indian region and nearby islands. So, it's a high throughput satellite as we just discussed, HTS. So, the quartet. One was GSET-19, one was GSET-29 and this is GSET-11 which was finally not launched in April but in December 2018 on Orion-5 rocket from uh, Kourou launch, launch base in French Guiana which is located 5 degree north to the equator in South America. 
it's, it costs 1200 crores including the launch fee of Orion space so it's also a high throughput communication satellite which will drive countries internet broadband connectivity so two are already in space this was a third one gsat 19 and gsat 29 and this was gsat 11 in december 2018 the fourth one is gsat 20 which will be a four ton class high throughput satellite which will be launched towards the second half of 2019 so they will form the backbone of pan india digital program that like you know bharat net program 2 which was launched in october 2011 earlier it was called national optical fiber network so it aims to provide 2.5 lakh villages with e banking e education e health and e governance so through reliable broadband connectivity so that is going to be benefited bharat net project is going to be benefited by these high throughput satellites also in flight internet and village web services are other goals under it so it will also bridge rural urban divide too. But then each of the high throughput satellite has a different space location over India and must have its own ground systems. So the, these ground systems are being built up by external agencies which have been chosen through competitive bidding. So it will serve the remote hilly areas to Jammu and Kashmir region with reliable net services. So the ground stations are also being, uh, being developed. You can see cave and hub or gateways being set up in Delhi, Bengaluru, Ahmedabad and Ranchi to deliver this high speed broadband services via the giant satellite so ground infrastructure has also been developed so this is the satellite the entire detail given launched from french guiana and this is regarding the bharat net project too, which aims to provide broadband connectivity to rural areas 2.5 lakh gram panchayats which will cover 6 lakh villages it's called the world's largest rural broadband connectivity project. So there are phases under it too. Phase 2 of the project is for 1.5 lakh G, uh, gram panchayats to be covered as such. So that phase 2 has also been launched. And this is French Guiana in South America. Shown. It's not a separate country. It belongs to Europe, France. Then next is GSAT-31, which is again a communication satellite, India's 40th communication satellite, which was also launched from French Guiana. So this is the detail given here, you can see. So it is expected to enhance connectivity for ATMs and ensure, ensure uninterrupted direct-to-home services to GSAT-31, India's 40th communication satellite. It has KU band transponders, no KA band. It has also been launched in a geostationary orbit. And its applications are given here DTH, ATMs, etc. Then next is GSAT 6A, which is actually a satellite which has been launched uh, for military communication purposes, but it has been lost. So here you can see uh, it was built to last 10 to 12 years and uh, it was to be a standby for three years, which will replicate GSAT-6, the earlier satellite for military purposes. But then contact was uh, lost with the satellite GSAT-6A. That is what has happened with GSAT-6A, launched in March, uh, you know, 2018. This is the detail given here. So it had high power S band communication satellite for military purposes for the use of armed forces. But it has been lost. One H also was lost because you know the heat shield failed to separate, and uh, now this G set 6A has also been lost. So this was also under controversy GSAT-6 and GSAT-6A because of its 90% of its transponders which were leased to Devas Multimedia by ISRO's commercial arm Antriksh. So this Devas Multimedia was a Bengaluru based private organization which was used the GSAT-6 and 6A transponders in the crucial S-band wavelength which is primarily for military purposes for countries strategic interests. So of course this deal was annulled in February 2011 and GSAT-6A was launched but it has been lost. 
So this is the detail of GSAT 6A2. You can see it was the ISRO lost contact with the satellite minutes after the second firing of its onboard engine. Then next is GSAT 7A. GSAT 7A is a communication satellite which has been launched by GSLV from India itself. So it will enhance the communication infrastructure of the Indian Air Force for the Army of the of, for the Air Force. So it will you know add new space dimension to the way Indian Air Force interlinks, operates, and communicates with its aircrafts. So the satellite uses KU band and it provides superior real-time aircraft to aircraft communication. You know, in flight communication or and also with the commanders on the ground. So, it will support aerial activities of the army and the navy also wherever required. So, it's not just for the air force, but essentially for the air force. So, GSAT 7 has been used, you know, uh, since August 2013 by the navy for similar purpose for linking the ships to command on land. So, GSAT 7 is for navy, and now GSAT 7A, which has been launched, is for air force. So it was GSLV MK2 with indigenous cryogenic stage, which carried on board this heaviest satellite, uh, its heaviest satellite weighing 2,250 kg. So it's also called Angry Bird. So it's for aircraft to aircraft communication. Then next is Chandrayaan 2, which is India's second moon mission. So, it was supposed to be launched in April 2018, has been delayed multiple times. It was later set to be launched in October 2018, then it was delayed to Jan 2019 and now finally, you know, recently it came up that it will be launched in July 2019. So, Chandrayaan-2 is one of the crucial launches of the ISRO, Indian Space Agency, and particularly after Chandrayaan-1 and Mangalyaan, which have been success. So, it will be ISRO's first attempt to land a rover to, on the moon. So, Chandrayaan-1 was only an orbital. It orbited around the moon. Now it will be a lander and a rover involved. So rover is costing nearly 800 crore rupees, which will be made to land near the yet unexplored south pole of the moon, which no one has gone so far. NASA, China's moon mission also plans to land here, but none have landed so far. So Chandrayaan 2 is fully indigenous mission that comprises of three modules in orbital, a lander, which has been named Vikram, and a six-wheeled rover, which has been named Pragyan. So, Israel, Israel will have this year long Vikram Sarai centenary celebrations to starting August 2019 in honor of the visionary scientist and legendary founding father of Indian Space Agency, Space Research, that is Vikram Sarai. So, even the lander has been named Vikram. So, here you can see in his honor. So, Chandrayaan 2 will be launched on JSLV MK3, which is a three stage heavy lift launch vehicle that has been designed to carry four ton class satellites in geosynchronous transfer orbit. Chandrayaan 1, you should know, was launched on a PSLV, but Chandrayaan 2 will be launched on a GSLV. So, this is, you can see, detailed. China also plans to go to lunar south pole. NASA is working to send astronauts there by 2024. So, according to NASA, some regions of the lunar south pole have permanently shadowed craters with some of the lowest temperatures in the solar system where water ice is stable. So, it has significant ice deposits which are untainted by sun's radiation or geological processes. And one of the goals of Chandrayaan-2 is also to find water on the moon. So, NASA has also confirmed that Chandrayaan-2 and even the Israeli lander Bereshit on moon, they are going to carry NASA-owned laser reflect, uh, retro-reflector arrays too. So, this is regarding Chandrayaan 2, the moon mission. This is lunar south pole, you can see shown here. The lander and the rover shown here as such too. And they will launch from Sri Harikota. So this is the entire journey shown also of Chandrayaan 2. And this is regarding Chandrayaan 1, India's first moon mission, which was launched in 2008, almost 11 years ago. Its mission year, life was two years. But it lasted only one year, but it achieved majority of its objectives. The project cost 3.86 crores, Chandrayaan 1. And biggest achievement was discovery of the presence of water molecules on the moon. And it also had this moon mineralogy mapper, which was in a NASA payload on Chandrayaan 1, which was able to uh, you know, probe 97% of the lunar surface and detected water on the moon too. So this is the achievements of Chandrayaan 1. It placed tricolor on lunar surface 
two months into launch, Chandrayaan one found iron on the moon, but it did not have a lander. Nothing landed. Only the tracker was placed on the moon. So there are many other lunar missions which have been planned but failed. But India in its first attempt succeeded. So that was a huge achievement too. And this is the Chandrayaan two landing site, the lunar south pole. And this is the Beira sheet uh, lander, which is also a lander on the moon, and it's the first private lunar lander. So it's an Israeli company which is planning this. And this is regarding Mangalyaan two, India's Mars mission. So, and this is actually the first time ever that any country on an interplanetary mission has been successful in its first attempt. So Mangalyaan, or so-called Mars, Mars Orbiter Mission, which cost $69 million, was also launched. Here you can see its trajectory shown here. It was launched in 2013. Chandrayaan 1 in 2008, Mangalyaan in 2013, and now Chandrayaan 2 in 2019. So here you can see it reached Mars, started orbiting Mars as such too. This is the Mars orbit. 2014. So its mission to study Martian surface and its mineral composition and search for methane on in on Mars atmosphere. So Mangalyaan has also been successful. Then this is LSPT, that is Lander Sensor Performance Test. So this is a test for Chandrayaan 2. It's a crucial test for lunar lander sensors. So ISRO plans to fly the sensors on an aircraft over its artificial lunar site. So, Israel has developed its artificial lunar site at Chalakere in Chitradurga district in Karnataka, which is about 200 kilometers from Bengaluru. So, Israel is conducting its uh, lunar sen uh, sensor performance test. So, we see how the, how these sensors would function and guide the Chandrayaan to landing craft when it starts descending on lunar terrain. So, it will be through an aircraft that this landing would take place. So you should know about what is this LSPT and it is for Chandrayaan 2, you should understand that. So this is shown here, you can see. So you can go through the details, we will quickly cover up. Then this is pad about test. So this is regarding the test for of an experimental space crew capsule. So it is an important part of human space program. So if there is any, any, you know, in, Quite any uh, any accident or any such uh, requirement and disaster which may occur, the crew needs to abort. So this is the pad abort test which was conducted by ISRO actually Harikota uh, in uh, the space uh, the Satish Dhawan Space Center in coastal Andhra Pradesh, where in a pre-programmed automatic sequence the rocket as such reached a height of 2.7 kilometer and curved down into the Bay of Bengal on parachutes. And the module as such was retrieved later by three boats. So this is a pad abort test, crew escape system. So it's the first in a series of tests which will be required for the human spaceflight program of India. So there are three countries which have sent humans in space. They are US, Russia and China. So they have developed their own systems. And India is also planning a human spaceflight program. So this is an important test in that context, which was conducted in July 2018. From here, Sri Harikota, which is shown here, you can see in Andhra Pradesh, coastal Andhra Pradesh. Then, this is regarding Gaganyan, India's human space flight program, which uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced on 15th August 2018 that by 2022, the independence day of 2022, we'll have three Indians launched in space for a period of five to seven days. So before the Indians, are, you know, humans are placed in space, two non-crew flights will also take place in 2020 and 2021 and then by 2022 a human space flight. So this mission is estimated to cost 10,000 crore rupees and it is said to have significant spin-offs in multiple dimensions like technology spin-offs, you know, generate employment and train human resources also in advanced technologies. It will also be launched through uh, Sri Harikota. So many tests are required for this, like uh, for the manned mission, like the pad abort test, which we have conducted, space capsule recovery experiment, crew module atmospheric reentry experiment, which India will conduct. So if successful, India will be the fourth nation to circle the Earth, send humans in space after Russia, USA, and China. 
An Indian astronaut has already been sent in space and orbited the Earth as part of a Soviet mission in 1984, and that was Wing Commander retired Rakesh Sharma. And this is regarding the human spaceflight program Gaganyaan. So uh, for this program, there is a human spaceflight center which has been created, newly created center in Bengaluru, where the Gaganyaan project work would be undertaken. So it is ROS Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology, IISST, Thiruvananthapuram, which will produce around 100 space engineers each year, each year, which will be the primary source of talent for the Human Space Flight Center. So this is regarding the Human Space Flight Program to what India plants. The launch vehicle also you should know is GSLV MK3. Other developments which we need are like the food, the suits for the astronauts too. So finally we also plan to send humans to moon too. This will be only humans orbiting here later sending them to moon as such too. And even to Mars. So these are future missions which will be possible if this human space flight program is successful. So here you can see the low earth orbit and how you know the entire mission would work. This is a crew module recovery experiment which was conducted too. You can see it. Because when you send humans in space, they should come back safely to Earth too. So that is important. So this is a Kaganyan mission detailed out. Also Chandrayaan 2, some details provided here. Chandrayaan 2 is going to cost 800 crore rupees. And this is around 10,000 crore rupees. Then this is in India's twist with its man in space. So Rakesh Sharma became the first and only Indian citizen to travel in space in 1984. Then you can see we have signed MOU for manned space mission with Russia also, but it was abandoned in 2010. And we are developing a MK3, JSLV MK3 to send humans in space. So this is regarding JSLV MK3 also details then next is defense food research laboratory mysore so it's a food research center of drdo which uh, which has been developing food for army navy and air force so nutrition food for uh, harsh sub zero hot or hilly under sea or flying areas so in such uh, hostile conditions food is being developed by uh, drdo it's a laboratory that is dfrl in mysore so it has also developed starch based edible plates cups and spoons so that uh, you know there are no telltale traces of moving troops also and if such uh, food is used in space also it will result in no addition of trash in space travel too. so this food research center is now working on the human mission as first human mission too of developing food for them so this is dfrl you should know about it So here you can see Indian Army faces one of the biggest challenges in maintaining troops at one of the world's toughest battlefields at around 18,000 feet height. So food required over there. So DFRL has been successful in providing it wholesome, nutritious food. So now it will provide food for space travelers. The next is Mission Shakti. So this is the anti-satellite missile test which India conducted. And it became the fourth country in the world after US, Russia and China to have this capability. So this was a satellite in low earth orbit which was uh, targeted that was Microsat R which had been launched on PSLV in Jan 2019. So it was a 740 kg satellite which was placed in a very low orbit up to 74 km above the earth's surface and uh, the ballistic missile defense program was the one which was used, the missile under it was used, a modified missile, ASAT missile, to target this satellite. So, Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced about its success and said that the test was to maintain peace rather than war mongery. So, we have this capability, ballistic missile defense program has been developed long back. So, we already had this capability, but now a test was conducted to showcase this capability and a satellite was destroyed, that is Microsat R.
can see. So ASAT missile was a modified exoatmospheric interceptor missile of ballistic missile defense program. And this very low earth orbit of uh, less than 200 kilo, 300 kilometer was chosen to minimize debris. So debris, it is said, microsat are uh, blasted into 270 pieces and most of them are expected to disintegrate within 45 days. So debris would fall towards earth, but they would burn up as soon as they enter the earth's atmosphere. So there will be no debris generated. So it is said to be what is the benefit of this anti-satellite test is it will act as a space deterrent dissuading adversaries from targeting the country's satellite network. No such incident has ever happened. But then tests have such tests have been conducted. In 2007, China has conducted such a test in an orbit of 800 km above Earth's surface and it had drawn global condemnation. In 2008, USA also launched its Operation Burnt Frost to intercept and destroy a non-functioning U.S. National Reconnaissance Office satellite named USA-193. But then never have countries claimed credit for shooting down their satellites, it is said. And U.S. President Donald Trump has been pushing USA for having its Space Force too. So after the Army, Navy and Air Force, a Space Force is also proposed by Trump. So he has directed his administration to enhance America's space war fighting capabilities. So that is uh, um, America's long-standing concern that China and Russia are developing anti-satellite systems, so which will put American GPS-based technology at risk. Now India also has anti-satellite system. So this is the entire you know uh, ASAT mission Shakti detailed out how it happened, which we just discussed. And this is the ballistic missile defense program which we have. So, intercepted incoming missile is intercepted by radars, and the missile interceptor missile is launched and which engages and destroys this incoming missile. So, this is the detail regarding Mission Shakti 2 again. So, and this is regarding Indian space debris as such too. So it has said amount of Indian space debris has almost doubled in the aftermath of mission Shakti, but it is still significantly less than existing space debris generated by China, Russia and USA. So it says 80 pieces of space debris are attributable to India in orbit. So even those non-defunct, non-functional satellites become space debris. So this also 80 pieces of space debris attributable to India does not include this uh, mission Shakti or Microsat R debris. So that is excluded. Still, you can see India has space debris and NASA has criticized India for the test as such. Though US President Trump uh, supported it indirectly, but NASA has criticized telling it is a terrible, terrible, terrible thing and endangering the International Space Station. It says nearly 400 orbital debris have been generated. You can see so 80 Indian in 80 space debris belong to India, 4091 pieces of debris belong to USA, 4025 to Russia, and 4038 to China, according to this private organization Space Track. So, there are huge amount of space debris orbiting the Earth. European Space Agency says there are 34,000 debris objects of more than 10 cm size and 9 lakh objects from 1 cm to 10 cm size and 128 million objects, you know, very small objects which are orbiting the earth. And speed with these, which these objects hurtle through space travel makes them extremely dangerous. So, International Space Station actually has a debris shield also deployed along, it, along its crude modules. So, each of these debris shield is composed of two metal sheets separated by around 10 cm. This is the debris in and out of orbit of various countries. This is regarding India's debris in orbit and debris out of orbit. Then next is small satellite launch vehicle. So ISRO is now planning to develop small satellite launch vehicles on which small satellites can be launched. So ISRO is uh, most sought, most, most sought after space agency to launch small satellites. So, on demand access to space will be possible through this SSLV. It will take minimum only 15 days and minimum personnel to even assemble the rocket. So, it will reduce the launch time as well as cost to launch small vehicles. 
So its lift up mass is of 120 tons, which is proposed, and it can place a 500 kg payload to at a height of 500 km in the lower orbit. So it will be a three stage, so you know, solid motor stage uh, launch vehicle like PSLV and JSLV. It will be able to accommodate multiple satellites also, small satellites. But then it will be as possible to assemble it horizontally and vertically. While PSLV, JSLV can be uh, assembled only vertically. So that will be a benefit too. So Israel is also looking for a location for small satellite launch vehicles launches. Like it's preferably near Gujarat along the western sea coast where this launch pad will also be developed for small satellite launch vehicles. SSLV. The next is giant meter wave radio telescope. So this is GMRT in Pune, which is an area of 30 fully steerable parabolic radio telescopes of 45 meter diameter. So it's operated by National Center for Radio Astrophysics. And astronomers have used this Indian telescope to discover the most distant radio galaxy ever known, which is located 12 billion light years away. So the galaxy from a time when the universe was only 7% of its current age was found using this giant meter wave radio telescope. So there are these radio galaxies which are a type of active galaxies that are very luminous at radio wavelengths. So they are very rare objects in the universe. They are colossal gal galaxies with supermassive black holes at the center. So that has been discovered through GMRT. So you should know where is it located to. It's a large aperture synthesis radio telescope. In Pune. So here you can see number of uh, 30 radio telescopes of 45 meter diameter. It's called the most sensitive synthesis radio telescope in the world. The next is Vikas engine. So, Vikas engine is the engine which powers PSLV, GSLV and JSLV MK3 launch vehicles of ISRO. And this Vikas engine is used in the second stage of light lifting PSLV in second stage of JSLV2 and it is the twin core engine core liquid stage of MK3 2. So, JSLV MK3 is important Mark 3 also called MK3. So, first GLF MK3 of 2017 started with 3200 kg satellite launch, second one for 3500 kg so it plans to launch even 4000 kg satellite in space so this is the vikas engine which is used in these launch vehicles which has been you know which whose thrust has been improved so that payload capacity can be improved too eventually isro wants to phase out the vikas engine and replace it with a cleaner and safer semi cryogenic engine so cryogenic technology which is used means uh, you know compressing the fuel into at very low temperature so that there is more space for payloads. So, cryogenic engine is what we are planning to develop for our launch vehicles too. But presently, it's the Vikas engine which powers the second stage of PSLV and GSLV. Then this is PSLV C42. So, this is the first fully commercial trip of ISRO in 2018. So, PSLV C42, it launched only commercial satellites. So, it launched two satellites of UK, Novasar and S14. So, together they weighed 889 kg. So, the two satellites are owned by Surrey Satellite Technologies Limited and were placed in a sun synchronous pole to pole orbit of 583 km from Earth. So, ISRO Antriksh arm, Antriksh Corporation of ISRO earned more than 220 crore rupees in this launch. The two satellites of UK launched Novasar. So, it is to test the capabilities of new low cost S band as, uh, no, satellite uh, performance. It will be used for ship detection and maritime monitoring, flood monitoring, agriculture, forestry applications, etc. And the next satellite S14 will be used for environmental monitoring, urban management and tackling disasters. So this is there. So PSLV C42 is the one. PSLV C41 launched IRNSS 19 and then PSLV has also bagged first Australian order to launch its nano satellite Century 1. So, this is also there. Century 2 of Australia will be launched on US SpaceX satellites, the private uh, US uh, no, space company, which has its Falcon 9 rocket. 
So India has been undertaking commercial launches since 1999. PSLV is the most trusted workhorse for this. It has put 237 small satellites of 28 countries in orbit so far and about half of them are from US. So US also uses Indian services because it is cheaper. Then this is hyperspectral imaging satellite HISIS, which was launched on PSLV C43. This is country's first hyperspectral imaging satellite dubbed as SHARPI. So it's for advanced earth observation. It was launched in November 2018. It also carried 30 small satellites, which were the co passengers with HISIS, hyperspectral imaging satellite on PSLV C43. So they were, these were 30 small satellites, commercial launches from Australia, Canada, Colombia, Finland, Malaysia, Netherlands, Spain. And 23 of the satellites were from US and one each from these countries. So this is there. So HISIS actually the primary goal is to study Earth's surface in visible near infrared and short wave infrared regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. So hyperspectral imaging satellite is an optical, it has an optical imaging detector chip. So this chip has also been indigenously designed. So, it has this camera also in space which can provide well defined images that can help identify objects on Earth far more clearly than regular optical or remote sensing cameras. So, it's a camera in space which will be able to give clear you know, images on, on Earth. So, it will be able, India will be, will be able to watch over India from space. It will be helpful in various sectors like defense, agriculture, land use, forestry, etc. So this is a hyperspectral imaging satellite launched on PSLV C43. Along with commercial launches. Then next is PSLV C44. So PSLV C44 launched 130 kg military imaging satellite Microsat R, which was launched on PSLV DL, also called PSLV C44 which means real means dual strap-ons so it was uh, you no know, it does not have the normal six strap-on motors as PSLV has so it had just two strap-on motors so it can carry higher slightly higher payloads than core alone version actually without strap-ons so two strap-ons were there the first time an Indian satellite was placed by Israel in a very low orbit its orbit is only of 274 kilometers much lower than any of its civil earth observation uh, spacecraft also even polar orbit is from 400 to 700 kilometers and you should con uh, connect this we have already discussed uh, mission shakti microsat r launched in jan 2019 was the one which was targeted in mission shakti or anti-satellite missile test so it was placed in a very low orbit so it you know it's much uh, you can see it uh, isro also uses launch as an opportunity to dis demonstrate the usability of the fourth stage of the rocket after the satellites are ejected into orbit so even the fourth stage of PSLV C44 ps4 was equipped with lithium ion batteries but no solar panels and you know it is said initial initially normally what happens is after the stages of the rocket detach it drop back into the sea the first three stages but fourth stage after releasing the payload wanders around in space as jump but now this fourth stage will be equipped with lithium-ion batteries and itself will also be used for experiments. So student satellite Kalam set being just 1.26 kg is attached to the fourth stage and it will act as an experimental platform for technology demonstrations in space. The fourth stage will last for around 6 months to a year. It will keep orbiting the space. So this is there. Then next is PSLV C45, Emiset mission. So its chief payload is Emiset, which is a 436 kg satellite, which was injected in 749 kilometer orbit. So it's Emiset, electromagnetic uh, satellite, imaging satellite. So it's for electronic intelligence. So it's an, it undertakes electromagnetic spectrum measurements, India's first electronic surveillance satellite. So it will add teeth to situational awareness of the armed forces. It will provide location and information of hostile radars placed on borders. Too. So it will be another dimension to the current land and aircraft based electronic intelligence of the armed forces. The fourth stage of this rocket will also man be maneuvered to a 504 kg orbit where it will release 28 international satellites. Too. 
and of these 28, 24 are small satellites from USA. So you can see. And other four customers are Lithuania, Spain, and Switzerland. And fourth stage will be guided to an altitude of 485 kilometers. And for six months, this stage will serve as an orbital platform for space-based experiments. So it will have solar panels also, which is also first time that uh, you know solar panels are being used. In the earlier uh, fourth stage, which became an orbital, there were no solar panels. But this will have solar panels. And the launch vehicle itself is also a new variant of PSLV called PSLV QL. And it will have four XL strap on motors on the first stage. So there are three experimental experiments aboard this orbital platform of IIST's advanced retarding potential analyzer for ionospheric studies called ARIS and other two also, which are detailed here. Which is fine. This is electronic intelligence. The next is starting May 2009, ISRO to launch a string of defense satellites. So ISRO has said that it plans to send at least eight Earth observation satellites of various use at the rate of almost one a month. Or even communication sat for defense purposes, communication satellite GSAT-32 will also be launched to replace GSAT-6A also. So then CARTOSAT-2 satellite will be launched, high resolution imaging satellite. So this is it. These are defense related satellites. Microsat R was also defense related, MUSAT defense related, even hyperspectral imaging has defense applications. Radar imaging satellite, etc. Then next is ISRO making green propellant. So, ISRO scientists have reported progress in development of an environmental friendly propellant to power satellites and spacecrafts, which will replace the conventional hydrazine rocket fuel, which is highly toxic and having carcinogenic chemical. So initial tests are being conducted by the research, research team at Liquid Propulsion System Center of Divinantapuram. So this, uh, you know, has been promising. The result, uh, result test results have been positive. So, so that, uh, you know, this monopropylene plant based on hydroxyl ammonium nitrate can be developed as an alternate fuel, green propellant. So monopropylene is a chemical propulsion fuel which does not require separate oxidizer. This is being developed by ISRO green propellant. So this HAN, hydroxyl ammonium nitrate is said to be less toxic than hydrazine and has better performance too and safer. Then this is ISRO offers battery technology to firms. So indigenously made lithium ion batteries you know have been developed by ISRO which uh, and it's it's offering this production technology to Indian industry. So request for quotation has been issued so that industry can produce a range of such lithium ion cells for many purposes mainly for electric vehicles too. So in-house technology will be transferred by ISRO by Vikram Sarabhai Space Center of Israel. So, so, so for a one-time fee of rupees one crore. So government also plans to achieve 100% electric vehicles in the country by 2030. So lithium ion batteries are one major component in that. Currently the lithium ion batteries in India are imported mostly from China, South Korea and Taiwan. So Local production should be given a boost, which has been reiterated by Niti Ayog too earlier. So this is being given a boost. ISRO has offered this battery technology for firms for a one-time fee of rupee one crore. So the advantages of lithium-ion batteries are given here. It has high energy density, does not need prolonged charge when new, relatively low self-discharge also, and zero maintenance. The next is Indo-UN Small Satellite Program. So India has launched this Indo-UN Small Satellite Program, which actually UN has, uh, you know, uh, has requested to spacefaring nations to have such a program. So this will be a program for three-year period to train a total of 90 qualifying engineering graduates from various countries to build and test three small satellites each year. So ISRO's Bengaluru-based UR Rao Satellite Center, as such, will train these overseas students. 
and if uh, the satellites are good enough, ISRO may also launch them. And this is in that context only UNIS, UN's Unispace Nano Satellite Assembly and Training by ISRO. So it's a capacity building program of ISRO, UNATI, which was inaugurated in Jan 2019. So it was to commemorate 50th anniversary of first UN conference on exploration and peaceful use of space. That is called Unispace. So it has been 50 years now. So it's the 50th anniversary. So this UNATI actually aims to provide opportunities to participating developing countries to become stronger in assembling, integrating and testing nanosatellites. So it will be a three-year program as proposed above to same. It's the same thing and there will be three batches and officials from around 45 countries will benefit from it. First batch will be for three months where uh, we have 30 delegates from 17 participating countries. So that is a specific name given to this Indo-UN small satellites program, Unnati. And this is capacity building program directorate. So ISRO has this new capacity building program directorate which has been launched in Agartala in northeast in Tripura. So it's a space technology incubation center which will be located in National Institute of Technology Agartala and it is first of six such centers planned nationally to build capacity in new locations. So these will be incubation facilities where ISRO will invest. So domestic industry is required to increase production of critical electronic systems needed in space and other programs because 75% of it is imported now. So ISRO has this plans of a capacity building program directorate. ISRO has been you know, asking private sector to take up the responsibility. It wants industry to raise its engagement in country space program, help drive production of PSLVs that ISRO needs to meet its fast expanding launch, sh launch schedule in the coming years. So, this is what ISRO is saying. So ISRO would be freed and can focus on pursuing new technologies and challenges of manned space mission too. So 85% of launch vehicle cost and 50% of the spacecraft costs cost going to in, uh, will go to industry that supply components and systems to ISRO. So there's a huge potential here for private sector. And this is ISRO ropes in three partners. So ISRO has roped in three partners to help it assemble 27 satellites at a quick pace over the next three years. So you are our satellite center signed separate three year contracts with various uh, bodies as such for this. So they will work with UR RAW satellite center to produce three small to medium satellites each year. So total of 27 spacecrafts by July 2021. So that is the plan. Then this is ISRO to launch a TV channel. So ISRO is planning to have its own TV channel. So even as we discussed, Vikram Sarabhai's sanitary celebrations would take place starting for from August 2019 for a year. So during that time, ISRO also plans to dedicate its own TV channel showcasing space application, targeting young viewers, especially in rural areas. So this is being planned. So can see ISRO will shortly start allowing public to watch satellite launches from its Sri Harikota center too, the way NASA has such facilities. This is regarding ISRO missions and this is regarding Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, so the brain behind Indian space exploration program. We believe that satellite television system could bring in further reach to social and economic development and make the communication system in India more potential. The next is ISRO telemedicine nodes for soldiers in high altitude areas. So ISRO is you know, in, in its major effort to improve emergency medical support to soldiers in high altitude areas, especially in Siachen. ISRO has signed an MOU with the Integrated Defense Staff of Defense Ministry to set up telemedicine nodes in critical places across the country. So such 53 nodes will be developed in the first phase above, over and above the existing 20 telemedicine nodes for Army, Navy and Air Force across the country. So through communication through satellite enabled telemedicine nodes will be a paradigm shift in delivery of life saving healthcare till the weather clears up and movement is possible in such hostile areas in the country. So that is telemedicine. So through online services, healthcare professionals 
you know, even through video conferencing can provide, you know, valid information for diagnosis, treatment and prevention of disease. And next is, ISRO awaits advanced materials. So, ISRO wants advanced materials which will drive the future space program. So, it uh, wants uh, private sector to come in and pursue this so that, you know, advanced materials with extraordinary properties such as aluminium, beryllium alloys, carbon nanotubes can be developed in the country. So, these will be required for the human space flight program, reusable launch vehicle program, etc. So, uh, advanced materials also include these carbon carbon composite, composites, you know, which are used uh, also for electronics. So, it wants lab R&D can develop small quantities of such advanced materials, but industry should come forward and produce them in large quantities is what ISRO chief is calling for. So, this is regarding advanced materials. Materials that are utilized in high-tech applications. So, typically traditional, material, uh, typically traditional materials whose properties have been enhanced. So, semiconductors, biomaterials, etc. are advanced materials. Hmm? Like titanium alloy for supersonic airplanes, magnetic alloys for computer disk, or special ceramics for heat shield of the space shuttle, etc. These are advanced materials. And the last news is Anitha Sat. So, this is a lightweight satellite developed by Villette Ovia, who is a 17-year-old girl from Trichuri. So, she has developed this satellite which she has named Anitha Sat after a medical student who appeared for NEET, but you know, she could not pursue a career in medicine. Uh, so, she died so, because she failed to clear the NEET exam. So, in her memory, this satellite has been named Anitha Sat by Villette Ovia. So, she herself is also a medical aspirant and this Anita set has been fitted with GPS and a camera. So, the satellite will be pushed into troposphere at a height of 15 km in a helium balloon. The balloon will explode and the capsule will come down towards the sea and measurement of temperature, air quality and concentration of gases in atmosphere can take place through this. So, this satellite Anita set has been developed because of Miss Ovia's participation in a reality TV show ASM three years ago. So, this is Anita Sat, the girl who built the satellite and the girl in whose name the satellite has been named Anita. So, it's for uh, observation uh, of measuring temperature, air quality and concentration of gases in atmosphere. So, that is it. These are the news items from Science and Technology Space with respect to Indian Space Organization, ISRO. So, that is it. Thank you.